Welcome to everybody listening in. We are very excited to have you here to talk about something that we think is sometimes an underemphasized area of open source, which is the government's involvement in it. First, the introductions. Uh, my name is Ivan Petsch. I'm Open Forum Europe's uh, research director. And I am Paula Grzegorzewska, policy analyst at OFE. We are a Brussels-based think tank that is committed to advancing openness in digital policy. So why do we say in the title, give open source the weight and policy that it deserves? I think here in this room, everybody knows that open source is absolutely ubiquitous in tech. What company working with code today isn't using open source software? Nobody would start a software project in 2020 without using open source software components. So for us here, it's very clear that open source saves a lot of development time, it enables innovative projects, and it provides equal access. But the truth is also that open source is a niche. What I'm saying is, ask yourself, has your mother ever heard about open source or your siblings? And crucially, does your local representative, your politician know? Does your typical policymaker know what open source is? Clearly, in almost all cases, the answer to this is no. They know about labor policy. They maybe today even know about data protection but they don't know about open source. And what we see here in Brussels is that even those who write digital legislation rarely know what open source is. And so we wondered, what do we have to do, what do we have to show for after many years of advocacy toward lawmakers around the world? And this is also something we ask ourselves regarding our work. And we're currently doing research into this and the answer seems to be not that much. What we do have is a number of laws or norms favoring open source in public procurement, meaning the government says that when they buy software, they will buy open source if it is of similar quality and availability. This seems like it might be one thing connecting open source and public policy around the world. This is also the one that seems easiest to understand and implement for policymakers. You can implement it with a few people believing in open source who can influence public policy around. And a lot of countries have tried their hands in this with, though admittedly, maybe mixed results. Seeing outside of public procurement, we don't have a lot. This differs a bit between countries, of course. Again, having surveyed this very broadly speaking, it seems that governments in Western countries, such as the United States, Latin America and Europe, they approach open source purely from a public procurement perspective, hoping that there might be also some indirect favorable effects from that. And on the other hand, we see governments in countries in Asia that also do some work in getting their industry hooked up with open source software to support the digitalization. But we were wondering, isn't there more potential in open source than just saying it will save us X percentage of development cost in terms of the government? What do you think? I think we can talk about this a little bit more in the Q&A section in 10 minutes. Um, but just as an exercise now for us, we thought about a few policy fields that digital policymakers engage with on a daily basis uh, that we see here in Brussels uh, day to day. And it really isn't difficult at all to see what open source can do in those fields. So if we think about open source and cybersecurity, and there you can immediately see you have auditability of code that increases trust. If you look at open source and research innovation, you see making innovation more open, increasing access. If you look at open source and machine learning, making automated decisions more transparent is a, is a positive. If you look at open source in high performance computing, breaking existing lock-in effects of dominant suppliers, um, and then if you look at open source and telecommunications, you can have uh, interoperability on all levels of the stack. And if you look at copyright, well, those who know Article 13, and uh, that is a term to them, maybe we, we should better not talk about this. <laughs> um, but I'm going to be a bit cheeky and I'm going to say that no policymaker in the world working on the latest cybersecurity legislation has ever included a paragraph on open source software or even hardware. And so why is that? We think that is because they don't know the role of open source today. They don't know that open source already plays a huge role in all of these areas. They don't know how important it actually is in the digital space. Whenever we talk to policymakers about open source, very few will know that open source is about, and those that have heard about it will often have huge misconceptions about it. They don't know that the IT industry today is built on open source, that all of these jobs are connected to it, 
uh, and that huge communities exist around it and that it is big business as well as a big idea. So that's we're trying to where we're trying to come in and so I'll hand over to Paula now. So the question might be why do policymakers don't know much about open source? A big part of the answer is that uh, there is a lack of cross-sectoral research on the issue and uh, subjectively noticed by us decrease in the number of those who research, promote and explain open source, both to policymakers but also to other people. But also global, unstructured and by nature free character of open source does not make it easier here. In order to develop and implement policies in a given area, policymakers need evidence. They need a number of jobs that can be created, innovation indicators, companies turnover, possible economic growth and all other numbers. We do have quite some research on open source, but very often it is not easy to use it in a policymaking environment. There are some organizations highly involved in researching open source and countries that gave open source quite a big spot in the digital policy agenda. So in recent years, we've seen, for example, the open source monitor from 2019 by the Digital Companies Association Bitkom in Germany, which is a report on the use of open source software in the German economy, including a survey of over 800 companies. Uh, another interesting case is France, where we have the, the association CNLL, a French national council for open source software. And this report includes a survey and quantitative data on the situation of open source companies and development in France, focusing on the digital transformation and innovation driven by open source. And another interesting study is, uh, is a study by our collaborator, a Harvard professor, Frank Nagel, that has done an interesting research on the impact of changing procurement law in France. This law requires government agencies to favor open source software over proprietary software in an attempt to reduce costs. What is interesting is that he found out that the policy change led to an increase of nearly 600,000 OSS contributions per year from France, an increase in number of companies that use open source, and an increased number of jobs, while bringing benefits such as higher competitiveness of the country's digital sector, both domestically and abroad. These are some of the largest pieces of research that have been done in recent years on the impact that open source software has in European countries. But what about Europe? The answer is that the last research was done in 2006. It was a study on the economic impact of open source software on innovation and competitiveness uh, procured by the European Commission. And it did find out that there is a great potential lying in open source for European digitization. But of course, the reality in 2020 is totally different than it was almost 15 years ago. Let's remember, the European Commission is one of the few institutions that could procure such a study that takes a look at the whole EU and aims to capture the nature of open source while taking into consideration so many countries. The European Commission seems to notice the potential of open source for the welfare of its citizens, competitiveness of its companies and transparency and speed of digitization efforts. It just needs evidence to do so, including understanding if it is indeed such an important and possibly beneficial tool for the whole Union. So, having said that, we were very glad to hear that the European Commission issued a call for tender to conduct a pan-European study on the impact of open source. Open source has been maturing for quite some time now, and we think that this is the time to provide the evidence. Needless to say, we at OFE have been pondering the idea of a European study on open source for quite some time now and pushing for it quite a bit as well. The European Commission has already made it clear in 2016 with its communication on ICT standardization prior priorities for the digital single market that it intends to promote the use of open source elements in cloud standards. It aimed at promoting the interoperability and portability of the cloud. And procuring this study shows that the Commission is committed to collaborate with stakeholders and open source communities and plans to include open source in its future digital policies, which of course makes us very happy, just like the fact that we got the opportunity to conduct this study together with the Research Institute Fraunhofer ISI. Even more, we, we are analyzing both open source software and hardware, which is quite particular. Maybe some of you know, but there is virtually no policies on open source hardware and very few who studied the subject from policy perspective, so we are very excited to do this work. 
And how are we going to do this? First, uh, we conduct the economic impact analysis of open source, which of course is much easier with software than hardware. Second, we research digital policies that relate to open source and actual open source policies in European countries, but also in a couple of other countries that might provide some lessons for us. And those include the US, China, South Korea, India, Japan, and Brazil. These two areas of research will allow us for at least a partial estimation of the impact that open source has on the European economy, but also to develop sound policy recommendations based on the factual state of open source. Of course, a big challenge here is obtaining and accumulating the needed data. Let's remember that research for policymaking is quite different than academic or technical research. On top of that, we conduct case studies that focus on different technological areas, such as AI, high-performance computing, and cybersecurity, and throughout the various industrial domains, so, for example, manufacturing, logistics, and health. But what I think might be interesting to you, we would like you to get involved. We had already mentioned this on quite some conferences, when those in real life were still allowed. Uh, we are conducting a big survey of open source companies, projects, and organizations. We developed the survey with a name of capturing the real face of open source within companies, both small one-person ventures and among tech giants. What is important to know, um, we don't want to survey only open source companies. Open source encompasses much more than open source companies. We talk here about using open source frameworks in large companies developing proprietary products but we also talk here about the use of open source hardware in both local maker, maker, maker spaces in your, uh, in your small towns and in cheap design among huge companies. The data that we gather within the survey includes uh, some numbers, of course we need that, on the usage of open source within companies. What kind of companies and organizations are using or contributing to open source? What is the open source related turnover? Uh, but also employment related to open source, innovation indicators. Is it actually true for all companies that open source can increase their innovati innovativeness? Subjective and quantified benefits of open source. Does it make some developers happy to work on an open source project in their job? Does it actually matter? Or maybe it's still more about the cost saving possibilities. These are just some of the questions that we search and answer for. So we would highly appreciate you participating in the survey. If you would like to get uh, notified when the survey is open, please click the link that we see here. Uh, it's a special list just for this purpose, so don't worry, we won't be sending you newsletters every week or using your data for any other purposes. Um, and these were some issues that we are trying to research. Uh, but of course, we have some more questions and we are curious what you think about some, uh, some of other issues, such as, do we even need more open source in public policy? Is it actually needed? Another one is, what role can open source play in the age of regulation? Because we see that the digital space is growing, we see that there is also more regulation following it, but is there a special place for open source in there? And the third question is, what are the benefits and opportunities that governments can see in supporting open source? Uh, these are the questions that we would like to leave to you uh, to wonder about, and maybe we can talk about it during the Q&A session. And with these questions in mind, we thank you for staying with us during this presentation. If you would like to contact us, feel free to write at euteam at openforumeurope.org. Reminder, if you would like to join the project and get involved in providing data for the future of open source policymaking, just contact us. Thank you. Thank you. Fantastic. Okay, so that's why that's why we do the test for OSI. <laughs> does a pre uh, was a test session with us to check it all out, and then it takes a minute to get it right during the actual um, actual talk. Anyway, uh, well, but uh, thanks for first for uh, all the active um, participation already in the chat and the question. Paula, if you could click on the shared notes just so I can read the questions, and maybe then we'll just try to kind of go few, uh, through a few of the questions that we have in the shared notes, and if you want to add something. Just go ahead and then we'll also go through that. 
Um, the first one is a good one, uh, and I'm not going to say, I'm not going to pretend like we have the answer to this. This is probably something that we all have to discuss. And also, within the study that we're doing, we are uh, primarily focused on the national level, so it wasn't 100% of focus um, of, or isn't 100% of focus of the study that we're doing. Yet, I think maybe um, something that, that we've seen uh, in the context of the municipal level and trying to figure out a little bit um, uh, what the role there is and you know what people on the on the city level or maybe municipal level can do. Um, an example here maybe is Germany. Okay, I'm German, so I know a little bit more about that. But um, in Germany, the national government is very inactive when it comes to open mm -hmm. source. You know, I, I said in the presentation that a lot of governments have public procurement um, laws, and Germany doesn't even have that. But on the uh, municipal and regional level, there's much more. And I think that also plays an important role in letting the national government know what opportunities are there. For example, uh, Dataport, which is the regional provider, the regional IT provider in the north in Germany for the for the regions, they are doing a great uh, project called Phoenix, where they're trying to create an open source uh, online desktop, you know, Nextcloud, uh, LibreOffice Online, you name it, or online office, I think, actually. Um, and this is something that I think the national level can really learn from. Um, and, you know, I'm, governments, they have hundreds of thousands of desktops, uh, with people working on them, um, and there's a lot of opportunity there um, uh, that go further than also just the desktop, even though, of course, we all know, even in governments, when we go further than the desktop, open source is already there, quite ubiquitous. I hope that kind of answers the question, but maybe there's also discussion possibility here, I don't know. Let's take a look at the Let's chat. Take a, okay, we're taking a look at the chat. Yes, Munich. Although, of course, that is a bit of a, a, a story riddled with issues. Um, probably uh, expectations in Munich were um, uh, a bit difficult and then also political issues. Um, but maybe let's not go too much in detail. Maybe let's go to the next one, just to keep things flowing a little bit. So the second question, research is often not usable. Right, yeah. This is a great question, uh, loving this question, because of course this is for us a great opportunity to talk <laughs> about what we do actually in Brussels, which is a lot working with researchers, trying to get, um, trying to get knowledge um, and research to policymakers. Um, so I think Paula is going to probably put something in the, she's working on it right now, she's going to put a link um, to um, the Open Forum Academy, which is a, um, a scholastic program that we run um, with uh, a number of researchers, but also practical um, uh, practitioners, um, where we work with them to bring them to Brussels. We organize events uh, relatively regularly, not right now, of course, although we're trying to get that started again. Um, to really, um, to really get uh, policymakers, and we have, I think, a good network in Brussels with all the digital policy people here, um, to 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 really surface that kind of knowledge. Um, if you would like uh, um, to, if you're interested in these activities, uh, also just email us at eu team uh, dot uh, at open eu team at open from Europe dot dot org. Uh, you saw the email address in the presentation. Uh, probably Paula will also put it in the chat. Um, um, and you know we're always really really happy to have additional people in uh, in this initiative, and I think uh, it's it's really great because this is essentially one of the things that uh, is uh, the the most maybe rewarding work almost that we can do is to really bring uh, uh, knowledge to policymakers. But I would also add that uh, I think it's a general problem. You know, like it's not a problem that is specific to open source in any way. And I think that many policymakers are actually searching for the contact with the researchers. So I think there is quite yeah. a big field to get engaged in that, and especially for some independent organizations that could work yeah. as a sort of intermediary between the, the researchers and policymakers. Yeah, that's a, that's a really great point, because I think just kind of expanding on that, uh, uh, policymakers often, they are um, um, they are faced with the issue that they need to write something, they need to write either something for a high up, or they need to actually write a law, uh, and then they try to figure out, okay, so what should we actually do, and so they're really they really need the input, uh, and they are, they're trying to get it from all sides. And if you're not in Brussels, uh, it will be it's very difficult to kind of get this knowledge to them. And so uh, this is one of the things that we try to do. Um, yeah. So just again, if you if you're interested in this kind of more policy work, um, just get in touch and let's talk. Yeah. 
Do you want um, to take the next one? <laughs> I mean, let's start, let's say. Okay. Uh, do you know of corresponding institutions outside of Europe doing similar research into open source policy making for their respective areas? I haven't encountered that much research focused on policies. Uh, there was like, we sort of called it the first wave of uh, open source, which was still 2012, I would 12, say. Yeah, maximum. And there was this big, big report on different open source policies around the world. I think yeah. the, like, the latest edition is from 2010. It was some professor from the US. Yeah, the um, center for, now the name escapes me, but they did this report. A few other organizations, but I think they also dropped out of the kind of open source topic. It's quite interesting. This is something maybe we don't have time to, to go into detail the, in, right now, but this is quite interesting the way open source, yeah, I think we call it waves. It's a bit of a difficult term right now, but okay. Um, the first wave, as we, we kind of call it a bit, um, from the early 2000s to maybe 2012, where it was very um, activist driven, very much driven from the community side. Um, and then um, for different reasons, uh, it went, died down a little bit in terms of the public side, the public sector side, the government side. And then, of course, open source already toward the end of that phase became so ubiquitous within the private sector, within companies, that now in this, as we call it, the second wave in, the, in recent years, um, the kind of um, perspective that uh, people are bringing toward governments is a quite different perspective, and it's more from the corporate side, and in some sense more, um, yeah, it's more corporate and, and more from, from this perspective. So it's quite interesting. Um, I'm not sure... Yeah, I have to be honest, I'm not sure if anybody else is sort of uh, doing similar work in other areas. But if you know somebody, <laughs> please let us know. <laughs> yeah, because there's a lot of initiatives that are more focused on like actually the usage and mm -hmm. development, but not on the policies yeah. themselves. Yeah, that's true. So a lot, of, a lot of the studies and research has been done very much on the, on the more corporate side. Mm -hmm. and of course, we're looking also uh, specifically on the public, public, uh, public policy side. Mm -hmm. Okay, next question. Uh, are you concerned about the big tech's embrace of open source? Is there a risk of open source becoming enclosed in cloud environments? Ah, well, that's a great question. <laughs> I don't know if this is quite in scope for our uh, for our uh, for our topic because we really focus on on public policy. Um, maybe I think maybe it's a little bit out of scope, but maybe the only thing I can say um, from based on our research is quite interesting that most of the procurement laws around the world. I want to say something maybe 60 70 percent do reference either those i open source definition or the fsf's free software definition um and from that perspective um uh, yeah quite cl quite clearly uh, um, um uh, going for this although of course you know well <laughs> those that uh, do um uh, close uh, cl closed uh, source um or closed um cloud services sometimes based on open source um probably are still um um, not like in violation of, of those uh, licenses. Okay, big topic, maybe not quite <laughs> for now. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Have a nice um, conference. Bye-bye. <laughs>